All right, so our topic is going to be, what do we know at this early point about what's going on with the coronavirus? Once I can get this, I have a question for you. How do you catch a virus? Viruses are plagiarists. They even hijack the production equipment for themselves, you know, from the cells. They don't carry along everything. They're thieves and plagiarists, and they're pretty much everything bad. How do you catch a plagiarist? Any ideas? If the plagiarist has an equation that says four score and seven years ago, you know, our fathers gave forth on this continent a new nation or whatever, you would say that that plagiarist, that sounds an awful lot like Abraham Lincoln. But you're not quite sure because the same kind of words can be used by the same person to describe something very well defined, especially something scientific. So it's not just the words that's there. But what if it said four score and eight years ago, our fathers brought forth from this continent a new nation, you know? And then you, um, you, you had a document that said that, and then somebody turns in their paper, and their paper says four score and eight years ago, right? You know that they got it from that rare case where there was a mistake. You actually catch a plagiarist through the mistakes, through the typos, and through the things that don't need to be reproduced but are reproduced. And so with that in mind, that holds true for viruses as well. You catch viruses by seeing where they make the same typo in the same place where they don't need to. So far, I want to end up with the conclusions. I want to try to keep this as short as possible because I want to show you where you can go and you can actually take control of the situation in some small way by going up and seeing what the um, data is that we have. There's an open science movement that's taking all the viral genomes and putting them online. And so you can see where the genome came from and what the differences are. There have been two uh, genomes sequenced from Washington already, from cases that were in Washington. One had traveled recently, one had not. The two Washington genomes are related, and that's the conclusion. So we therefore have a case of community transmission. That means that it's out and there's a lot of cases that we don't know. How many cases? Well, we look at the number of mutations that we've seen. We see three nucleotides different between the two genomes. And the usual rate for coronaviruses is about one to three mutations per month. So you can do the math for that. You see three changes, one to three mutations per month, so it's going to be one to three months, probably on average two months or six weeks. So that means that it's been going on for that long, and given the rate at which the virus multiplies, the best guess right now is that um, at the end of January, or is that right, at the end of February, at the end of February, that there were at least a couple hundred of cases just in the Snohomish um, area that these came from. Now, of course, there's only two genomes, and so I want to say from the beginning, it's not a lot. We have to keep watching as genomes come in, but the good news is we can keep watching because we have this site right here. Actually, I... I have the site on the back, so let me, let me get you the site. The site's called nextstrain.org, and it actually is an open science movement where they're pooling all of the genomes that they get from the viral isolates that they are, are able to actually sequence. The person who does this, the, um, the Trevor Bra uh, Bedford at the FHCRC, uh, the Fred Hutch down the road, is actually leading up the effort to do this. On his blog, you'll find a lot more information and updates. But what do you find at nextstrain or newstrain.org? Was it newstrain or nextstrain? Anyways, I always had to like look it up and click on it. But if you click on it, you get this. This is all the genomes that we have, and they're color-coded by geographical location. Anybody want to guess what purple is? What geographical location purple is? Yeah, exactly. So uh, purple is China. And you can see that there are a lot of genomes were obtained from the China area. The other colors are other continents. Our continent is red. And so you can see that there's a number of red cases that we see right here. The thing about it is that if you look down at the bottom, you see the two red cases that have come from Washington that have gone on this. Now, if you followed the news, you, you may have heard that we've had a number of new deaths just today. They're mostly coming from a single facility where it looks like the virus has spread. And um, as those information comes in, I assume that this tree will be updated. 
But for right now, the thing that you can see about the two red lines, these are the two red lines from Washington. Date of the first red dot around mid-January. Date of the second one, late February. So this is really late breaking news. But you can see how close they are on the tree. And as you remember from any of your biology classes, the closer ones on the tree are closer in sequence and are therefore uh, presumably related. I, want, I always like to get down to what the actual data is. So this tree is nice, but I wanted to look at the actual genome. If you click on the first Washington case, they actually give you, see at the bottom they have a GenBank accession number. So you can actually go to GenBank and download the sequence, which I did. There it is. It's like looking at the matrix, but I can actually see the letters. And this is not that many letters. It's eight, eight pages of text. Each of these letters represents a nucleotide, a piece of DNA. And each of them is a well-defined, you know, chemical entity that we can read like you can read the 26 letters of the English alphabet. It's just four letters of the DNA alphabet. And this is the whole thing. There's nothing else to this virus that, is, that at least contains the information that replicates and that causes all the trouble that we have. 30,000 characters, and I can fit it on one slide. So the thing is, for each of those dots that we had on that previous slide, we have 30,000 characters. How different do you think the different ones are? Now, the thing is, we don't know exactly which one was patient zero. We can guess that the purple ones were pretty original, but we have a lot of different purple sequences, and even they have some differences among them. So you can get down to a consensus sequence that's your best guess at what the original sequence was. And the first Washington genome had three letters out of those 30,000 different from the consensus sequence. You can go to the site and mouse over it and see exactly what they were. But you can see that it's about 30,000 long. You have one difference, one letter different at 9,000, one letter at 18,000, and one letter at 28,000. When you go to the second case that was ob obtained in the similar geographical area, both of them, I believe, were in Snohomish, you see Again, you have the 30,000 letters. Six letters are different from consensus now. But three of the letters are exactly the same as the first one. You see how you have this one right here, exactly the same. This one is exactly the same. And that one's exactly the same. Viruses do mutate. Like we said, they get one to three new mutations a month. But what are the chances that these two viruses actually came from separate places and ended up with exactly the same three changes at those three points. That's half of the changes in the viral genome. That's pretty clear evidence, even though it's just two data points, pretty clear evidence that the one on top, the first genome, was the granddaddy of the one on the bottom. The other thing you can look at is what extra mutations have we gotten within the second sequence? And you can see there's three more lines. You can see exactly where they are, one there and two in the middle. So that means now we have six letters different from consensus, the same three as the first genome, and three new ones. These were collected, like we said, about six weeks apart. But from the, um, from the general calculation of one to three mutations per month, that means this has been in the Snohomish area for one to two months, and the second patient had no contact that we know of with the first one, you know. For that number of mutations to show up, it seems like it would take a number of viral um, generations for that to happen, for that at the regular sort of uh, mutational rates. And so there's a couple hundred of cases that were in the Snohomish area at the end of the, um, at the, end of the month of February. That means it's been around. And so I want to say two things when it comes to this. This is, a, this is a nasty flu, and we really don't know a lot about it. Two data points don't tell us a lot. It's definitely worse than usual. How much worse, we still don't know. But also, it's not the walking dead, okay? We're not going to have to, um, uh, we might have to take measures that would be uh, to the extremes of quarantining, shutting down school. I know that you would all be heartbroken. Uh, we would probably move to online type stuff for maybe a couple weeks. Who knows what we need to do? It depends on how these cases play out. But the fact of the matter is, this looks like it's a very infectious flu. 
It looks like it's pretty nasty when it comes to mortality, but not among the worst when it comes to mortality, but we just don't know very much. But I was actually comforted by being able to see that we could see this, and the lab is continually interpreting that for us as well. I want to make sure that you know this is not my stuff, this is their stuff. But that's what we know about the flu right now, and I just wanted to give you my update on it. So with that,